Hello! Welcome to Microbiology Journal Club, where we now not big about all things small. My name is Danny, and in a previous life I dropped out for my PhD in microbiology, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. Nowadays, I'm a fact checker for a pharmaceutical advertiser and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC, dedicated in the public with the tools of Biotech. My name is Faz, I have a PhD in microbiology, I mostly work on bacteria, I've also worked as a research integrity specialist, I'm currently working as an editor for Scientific Journal. Every week we meet to talk about microbiology, and today it's our news week where we're doing an overview of some of the coolest microbiology papers that we've seen. And at the <laughs> end of the month we'll be selecting a paper to do a deep dive into, so make sure you message us at microtwjc if anything has caught your fancy. You can follow along with any of the papers that we discuss in our shared Zotero library linked in the DVD below. And we want to hear below. from you, so please <laughs> use the comments or tweet us at microtwjc. And uh, boy do we have a show for you today. First, uh, we have... Uh, do pe we have a couple papers looking at uh, Omicron, and do people recover it faster than the other variants? And we also look at how easy SARS-CoV-2 can evolve the switch between the endocytic route of infection from the current route of infection. Uh, and also we're looking at uh, how long can the virus remain active in air droplets, and also can the chemicals found in can cannabis be used to block SARS-CoV-2 infection in vitro? Uh, not only that, we've got <laughs> a newly discovered type 9 secretion system. Uh, we've also got uh, maybe an answer to a question that we haven't been, we well, should be asked, but have we found the cause of MS and is it the Epstein Barr virus? And finally, how many mm -hmm. people are currently dying as a result of the rise in antibiotic resistance and has the antibiotic apocalypse already arrived? Stay tuned to find out more. <laughs> Right on. Um, <clears throat> and first up, uh, as always, we've been covering a lot of SARS-CoV-2 and uh, Omicron variant is the variant of concern that everyone's concerned about around the world. Uh, we have a paper titled Active Epidemiological Investigation of SARS-CoV-2 Infection Caused by Omicron Variant in Japan. Preliminary Report on Infection so Period. So the <laughs> reason I'm digging up this paper and a couple of papers is because there's been recently some positive news about Omicron. People have, lots of people who like seem like experts are saying that, 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 that the infection period is shorter and there might be... So this is one mm -hmm. of the papers I'm looking at to try and find out what the backing behind the, that positivity is. Um, so mm -hmm. this comes from the <laughs> National Institute of Infectious Diseases in Japan, and it caught my eye because it specifically looks at the duration of virus shedding. So that's basically the amount of time from like getting infected to uh, clearing the infection. Uh, so there's been some talk about mm -hmm. it being shorter <laughs> with Omicron, uh, and that's been. And I think I think what's important about asking that question is the what's the highest level of evidence right, that we'll accept? Or, or what's the best level of evidence that we're going to accept to say like, oh, viruses are being shedded still? And you really want to be able to measure actual infectious particles, not just right the presence of an antigen or the presence of yeah, RNA. Yeah, because I think as we've like <laughs> talked about in... Like, actually, this is very early. So you probably wouldn't have seen this in our show, but early on, well, there was uh, some talks about testing <laughs> about like difference between detecting live virus and RNA, because sometimes the RNA can stick around a lot longer mm -hmm. than the actual virus. So the virus the genome will still mm -hmm. be there in a genomic form, but it won't actually be forming active viruses, and that might stay around longer. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> they, so that's why we yeah. need to look at active viruses or be, have an idea of the, the right proxy for that. And yeah. this is what the study looks at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and people don't typically, like, it's a lot of work to check for actual viruses because you're going to have to have, like, cell culture going. You're going to have to, like, purify viruses in a way that doesn't break them up and then plate them on those cell cultures to see how many particles are infecting. And so uh, that's why a lot of papers that we'll see out there are using sort of proxies for that. But the drug, or if we're trying to make a statement specifically about infectiousness like and the duration of that we want to make sure that the data set includes something uh, that can link us back to like specific infectious particles <laughs> right and so first up they're looking we've got some rna data that and they give us like they're basically looking at like positive samples from between 0 to 2 days 3 to 6 7 to 9 and mm -hmm. up to 14 days and it does seem there is still detectable virus or rna there but yep. what we want to look at is also can you actually isolate them uh mm -hmm. so let's see if i can pull pull down to the is there a helpful graph or no uh, i think it's, it's going... just a table <laughs> yeah so just a table so we're just looking at say this is the the, the column we're going to be looking at so mm -hmm. number of, so uh i think what they basically find is that um in most symptomatic people 
you take so again this is this is a very small study small. so we're looking mm-hmm. out of 16 people mm-hmm. uh they're finding that uh most people te- it takes most people about like a couple of days to clear out the active virus particles so by 10 mm-hmm. days uh the actual vir- the active virus particles stop being detected so yes um but they're still uh, showing the first column there i think is the pcr positivity yeah right? <clears throat> the yeah. the RN, yeah that's right and mm-hmm. the last column is looking at the uh, isolation of like positive viral rna from well positive viruses from viral positive rna samples so essentially like they at 14 days they've got like four people who, are, who still have viral rna but they can't find any virus being produced from those four mhm mhm and then so uh, this also mixes up between like infectious and asymptomatic. So they also looked at asymptomatic cases, and with mm-hmm. them they f- they found that after about but between six and nine days, you, there is a, the virus stops being produced, but mm-hmm. there is still viral RNA being hanging around. Yeah, super tiny though. <laughs> it's like such a tiny subset. <clears throat> I, I'm feeling also like on the on the on the backs of like some other papers that you picked out for us. Like it's hard to say if there's like. Uh, if this is like uh, interesting information from the asymptomatic set, this just like seems su- such like such a small number. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think so too. So this is more about trying to find out like why people are suddenly saying that five days is a use, useful isolation rather than saying whether that is yeah. accurate or not. So, <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, do you think? <laughs> sir, it seems. Uh, well, I guess we don't have any comparisons here. That's mm, one. That's, that's right. That's gonna. Yeah. stop us from doing like uh making some sort of uh conclusion just from seeing this data um but like five days kind of fits in the middle like it's like the average you know there will be people that are infectious past five days yeah uh, is what i'm seeing in this data right but but a lot of people won't be as well um <laughs> yeah i feel like the, this data is enough for me to like raise a question uh about it but mm-hmm. it but let's say i don't if if I'm going to make a decision that affects people's actual lives, yeah. I would want more data to have that confidence. Yeah. But... Min- Minref says in the comments, the problem is the long tail. And and I agree, yeah, right? exactly. Like, there are basically the ideas that there's like a sort of, yes, this is maybe the average, right? And you can say like the majority of people are here, but think about those individuals who are infectious for a lot longer. Like they're going to be creating super spreader events essentially exactly or, or outbreak events as they like journey through the world <laughs> yeah and this is, hasn't got enough like people in it for you for us to get an idea of that long tail and that could so if you mm-hmm. expand this up to like to a whole population you are still gonna get like outbreaks happening and so i yeah i would want to like ha- look at a study with a lot more people involved and luckily the nba have my back here because we're looking at <laughs> another paper called the viral dynamics and duration of PCR positivity of SARS-CoV-2 Omicron variant. So this is a study that comes for, uh, on the back of the National ba- Basketball Association. Basketball, basketball, I don't know. Um, basketball, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so they have a good, so for them, they've had a, quite an intensive testing strategy where they've been able to get like, this is all going to be reverse transcriptase PCR. So I think that with the asterisks we talked about before, where like this doesn't necessarily translate to to uh, infectious uh, particles mm-hmm. uh, in mm-hmm. a way. So I think what they do here is they they set a, set a cut cutoff point but by saying like under a certain like level of RNA, we're going to basically say that there isn't any infectious particles being made. Um, mm-hmm. Which I get, I get think that might have been validated by previous research, but I didn't really get that far. So, but that's basically what we're going with. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, that's the caveat, right? <laughs> like in, in in looking at this, like there is there probably is some association, but like we don't know. We can't report it to you here. Um, so yeah, base that, keep so, that as a caveat. Yeah, <laughs> these are all based on our RNA tests. So if we mm-hmm. like scroll down, oh wait a minute, I need to pull up the paper. Uh, sorry, I didn't prepare <laughs> as well as I thought I did. Um, yeah, I think so... uh, probably, we probably want to look at figure two when we get to this paper. Um... <clears throat> yeah, so let's see, figure two. Yeah. yeah. So this looks yeah. at... Uh, I mean, okay, uh, I'll open it up in a different tab because... 
uh, scientific papers are great. When you, whenever you want to zoom in on a figure, what happens is it creates a smaller <laughs> version of the figure, just so that. You... It's actually. I think that this is like something about um, mobile design as well, right? Like, cause it's like, oh, it's like a mobile thing. They want to make sure it fits in your viewport, but like, you're like, actually, I want to look really closely at a small graph. <laughs> do people not do that anymore on their phones? <laughs> Yeah, apparently, <laughs> apparently not. Um, yeah, so uh, what we've got is uh, so peak viral cotton concentration. So these are each data yeah. point that represents like a person, I believe. Um, yes. Yeah, one of the samples that was taken, and then they have yeah. So you can see, and they give this like jitter plot, so you can really see like the distribution of how all of those. Um, yeah, have all those dots. So given their cutoff in in B, I think, right? Given whatever their cutoff is in terms of um, really like where they say the cutoff of like viral titer would be. Um, there's this huge range, right, mm. from like 10, 10 days to four days in terms of when samples are still um, considered, uh, yeah, vi viral positive. <laughs> yeah. So they... and they have like longitudinal data, I guess, right? They've sampled these individuals like through time. That's how they can get something like clearance time. Yeah. How long it takes. Right, because the, the, these proliferation time and clearance time, these aren't like single samples. These are like from all the samples, right, of this individual. Like, how long did it take them? Uh, how long were they like uh, positive during that time? And then how long uh, from positive, right, did it take for them to go to negative? <laughs> yeah. And, Again, uh, using the CT cutoff. <laughs> yeah, and what we get here is also a comparison of the Delta variant. So they've got uh, the mm -hmm. in red is the Omicron variant, and in blue is the Delta variant. So. Mm -hmm. um, so let's so proliferation time what so can you break down what that means for me proliferation time would just be all the days in which they were positive right right <laughs> I think. okay yeah yeah I, I think that that's how it goes maybe it's increasing i don't think it is oh it could you know it could be increasing because they have like they do they can see like a peak day <laughs> so it's probably days going into the peak <clears throat> right okay so uh again they there are some differences in in these distributions, but um, so I mean, yeah, there there are some like peak viral concentration looks like there's a difference. So like, right, the idea is that less than delta, right, is what they're trying to, they're yeah. trying to say with this data. But mm -hmm. I mean, what you can see is that there is a very long tail on. So we, so there seems to be more Omicron like detections than delta in the this cohort. So it looks yeah. like. That's yeah. probably from the time, right? Whatever yeah. time window that they chose here. <clears throat> yeah. So what we are getting is a bit better view of that, like long tail of people who are like infectious, infectious for longer than a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the the graph that I quite I thought was quite useful was uh, the uh, Fig one because I think that shows uh, as well. Like I guess it shows the same thing. Um, yeah. And you can see every person as it's their own line instead of like a dot where they extracted the abstractions from. <laughs> yeah, and you can see some people clear clear faster, but there's there is like a distinct like average where people are carrying it for longer than that that five days. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I think a significant amount of yeah. people carry for longer than five days. Yeah, what whatever went into this recommendation, it's not it's not the science. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that what happens is like whenever you get a new st study com coming up, uh, you get like, like you, what I call like the first mm -hmm. pancake, where you, what well, your first pancake never turns out great. It's just, and mm -hmm. it's the same with like your first preprint comes out. I think what that happened was that there were a few like um, epidemiological studies that had some calculations that looked positive, and then people just grasped mm -hmm. on those immediately, and then mm -hmm. used that before the data was actually like properly validated. Um, yeah. So it, so I think that's why we've had, suddenly had this like jump in in that in terms yeah. of that. Um, I mean, also like there's just other concerns, right? People who are making decisions aren't just thinking about <laughs> preventing the spread of disease. I mean, arguably maybe they should be thinking a little bit more about that. Um, but yeah, I think other other factors have certainly fact yeah. went into this decision. <laughs> I, I, I definitely think that. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the next paper is also another one of uh, where I think people are getting up. Mm. Yeah, so high rate of asymptomatic carriage associated with variant strain Omicron. So I think this is based on some data that came out of South Africa um, ab mm -hmm. about um, 
Yeah, it seemed like the way that they collected this data was like uh, they have some sort of screening program that screens people irregardless of their status. So they mentioned something like when you go for your vaccine or something, you, you, you just get screened in general. So there are many ways in which people could just be screened without, you know, they didn't sign up to, <laughs> oh, I have symptoms. I want to know if I'm ill or not. There's just some baseline screening yeah. program. And so that that would capture a population that would screen positive, but maybe don't show any symptoms. <laughs> yeah. And I think in this case, you're looking at an H uh, a study of people living with HIV. So looking at evaluating the, the okay. vaccine. And it, as part of that, they took some regular nasal swabs. And based on that, they could actually mm -hmm. like look at the proportion of people who are carrying Omicron versus versus people who were, say, recovered. And this study was happening around the same time when Omicron was spiking in the Houghton province in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. really picked up a lot of, like, people who were lit who had Omicron but didn't actually show any symptoms. So, um... Right. Yeah. So this is... Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is that, uh, like... That e the people well, you're seeing lots of cases going to hospital, but the idea is that there are lots of more people out there, and I don't know why this is mm -hmm. suddenly like because I think there's there's this thing that's been taken as a positive in the news that oh we're gonna everyone's gonna get infected with Omicron as if that's a positive thing. Uh, yeah, it, it's not right because the, no. <laughs> for for the people that don't take it well, right? Like it means that they no longer benefit from like a herd immunity. Like and that's like the danger i think uh with the omicron variant predominantly mm -hmm. is that um right like there are so for people who don't like the vaccine is going to save most people from serious disease um and but it doesn't seem if, if 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 things continue as they continue i mean in some ways it's a pa it's a past conclusion for many countries mm -hmm. right like it already like blazed through uh the population in some ways but there could still be like sort of clusters of other outbreaks, right, that, that happen over time. Um, but th what that's going to do is it's going to expose more vulnerable people to, to that potential infection, and then that's not going to go well for them. Um, so I don't know. It's like yeah. not I – don't, I don't like the news story that people are saying that it's kind of a good thing because it's like, yeah, maybe it's a good thing for – for you like this individual sort of sense but it's not really a good thing like overall for everybody <laughs> yeah and i've seen like lots of people like because because i've been because i've been going mad this week because a lot of people have been trying have been out saying this might be the last like the way wave and i've been trying to find mm. evidence for that and i've not yet so if you have found something like that please post in the comments because it's not that i don't yes. want to have hope I just, it would be nice if we could have a little bit of that delicious hopium but <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah. yeah yeah like there's no sense of yeah, yeah I, just haven't... <laughs> I think maybe I might, I might have said this last week or two weeks ago when we were talking about omicron mm -hmm. it's like it's very difficult to know like the evolutionary path of something <laughs> um and yeah i think not knowing like sort of more about the origin of omicron as well like it just i don't know <laughs> to me it doesn't give me any strong indication to say like we're we're going to be in the clear <laughs> yeah i mean like yeah we can't predict what the next like variant will look like and we don't we don't necessarily yeah. know like because again we don't i mean there's so much we we don't know about how like our immunity and how that reacts because i'm mm -hmm. yeah um like i, I mean i think uh, here here's an open question that like we haven't seen any data for like what about omicron reinfection to omicron <laughs> right like like has that is that a thing can that is that possible like like uh yeah that i i feel like that's like an interesting question okay but then yeah. also yeah like uh because like immunity does wane a little bit right and yeah it's presumably better at getting through the antibody response do is it true is it really true that we'd have like a, a better antibody after a better antibody against omicron after omicron and we had some a small data set that we saw we might have a better antibody against delta after omicron right that there was like but that was a pretty small study i still think like some of that could be fleshed in a little bit more too to give us a sense of like what's next, oh, yeah. right? Or like what is our real capacity for 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 preventing another wave? Yeah, <laughs> just uh, from natural infection. I don't know. Yeah, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of like like work that needs to be done in that sort of respect. And and people mm -hmm. like talking about like COVID becoming endemic. Well, I mean, in South Africa, HIV is endemic. I mean, there's tuberculosis is endemic mm -hmm. in some places. Malaria is endemic. I don't think COVID being yeah. endemic is good news 
Um, no, <laughs> no, definitely, definitely not good news. If if people can work, if we can figure out how to work collectively, like as a society, I guess to not have that outcome, I would like that. <laughs> that would be the preferred outcome. Yeah. So I, I presented these papers because I was thinking maybe I I can find some hope in them, and that now I've ruined it for myself. I'm very sorry, and I'm very sorry to you. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think uh, at least for me in, in New York City, like we're sort of it seems like we're at the tail end of our Omicron wave, like it's going down. Um, but yeah, like what that means two weeks from now, <laughs> right, when when, you know, ostensibly people's behaviors have like gone back to right, people are sort of going back to interacting mm -hmm. like what yeah, what will we see from the surveillance side? I think that that's um, well, interesting. we're in the stage of the outbreak where every, where the but all the functions that we did that we used to like restrict the outbreak, like homeworking, they're being lifted back. So what I'm expecting is that like yes. we're at one edge of the roller coaster and we'll go slightly up. And how far we go up depends on a lot. So hopefully we don't go far up that far up that much. And it's mm -hmm. just like uh, a, like a, a little wobbly roller coaster. I hope it. But what might happen what well, we, we haven't ruled out happening sorry this is mo i'm not gonna say this might happen but we haven't ruled out that another peak will yeah, happen immediately ruled afterwards ruled out. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um uh but yeah. i think we'll, the next few weeks will tell us more uh, yeah i mean that's sort of all you can do and in terms of like personal safety like there's non-pharmaceutical interventions right are still like the de facto way to deal with things so i mean even if you're even if like you're entering a place that there's no rule that you should wear a mask like you still can wear a mask right that's still yeah. possible if if people are worried yeah a, a cow goes moo a sheep goes bot a faz goes wear your mask um <laughs> yeah yeah so like yeah i guess we might have said that in every show because obviously government Probably. security cameras are watching you so keep cover that face um <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm actually serious about that. I used to. I went to a computer vision conference that really scared me, and ever since then. <laughs> oh really? Oh no, yeah. I was one of the crazy people who was wearing a scarf over my face before the outbreak. So I mean, like. Uh, but anyway, I should. I should uh, spread I mean, that. It, <laughs> but. I was gonna say, like, what a crazy. We got a tangent there, but I, I did hear something like the the downtown London has like a lot of cameras. Oh yeah, right? King's Cross <laughs> was actually testing facial recognition software uh, around. Yeah. Them. So I was like, yeah, I had to go through that session every day for work. So I was like, maybe I don't want to give them too much of my data. <laughs> um. Anyway, I'm sorry for this All right, tangent. Well, let's, yeah, let, let's push on, and and maybe this paper. Uh, may also tell us like a little bit, or at least gives us some insight into what's going on from the evolution standpoint. Um, it's following up on that. Uh, so it's called uh, Rapid SARS-CoV-2 Adaptation to Available Cellular Proteases. Um, and it's in some ways, it's a follow-up of um, a phenomenon that we've talked about a couple times on this uh, show before, where uh, SARS-CoV-2 passage in Vero E3 cells undergoes a set of changes that uh, reduces its dependence on fear and cleavage. Um, <clears throat> which isn't good in terms of thinking about like uh, testing realistic virus. So like if people are doing their assays, they have to watch out for um, you know high passage number uh, artifacts that might emerge right in in the Vero system. But here they want to say like um, what how how does it arise? Right? What are maybe some of the um, dynamics that uh, contribute to the rise of this particular um, mutation inside of high passage populations. Yeah, so Vero cells are like these cells that, we t that were taken from, I think, the African green monkey, and they're used like very early mm -hmm. on in SARS-CoV-2 research it, because they, they, they grew it very well. But a couple of researchers found yeah. out that, that if you grow it too much in these Vero cells, the SARS-CoV-2 will evolve to remove its furin cleavage site. So that's the site that allows a spike protein to fuse, which means that the mm -hmm. pathway that is better for SARS-CoV-2 to infect the viral cells doesn't involve that cleavage, which cu currently is very relevant right now because that also is very similar to Omicron, yes. which also doesn't have a furin, doesn't cleave furin very well, and also use, uses an alternative yeah. pathway. So that's yeah. what makes this quite interesting. I think I think this is like, I mean, this is hindsight is 2020 so much, right? Because like everything's 2020 these days. I <laughs> We're still in 2020. Um, this is 2022, the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight is 2022. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but but yeah, very much so because 
this this observation, right, that the furin cleavage like site was being removed, but it was still infecting these cells, that is known. And in some ways, like no one really ex or at least I never heard it right in the news or like from like scientific analysis, like to take that observation and sort of extend it and say that means that there is a potential um, there's a potential state of the virus, right? A, a stable, right? a stable organization of it that doesn't require that it can fuse in a different way. Yeah. Right. Because they still get based some low level uh, infection events. Yeah, I feel that this is a kind of fact that actual SARS-CoV-2 ex experts knew coming into the outbreak and didn't because because yeah. uh, it's been found for like related coronaviruses, but I'm only discovering it like over the past few weeks because it's become relevant for Omicron. But yeah, uh, apparently right. this has been a thing the whole time. But this is one part of our reading where I kind of like went straight start off like starting a book chapter in the middle is how we've been with SARS-CoV-2 research. But there's lots of coronavirus yes. research that happened before that. Um, yes. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. Like, and maybe highlights just something about like science communication that um, is an interesting element that we're always, as people who aren't like deep experts and like knowing the history of the research, like we're sort of always starting just in the middle, right? Yeah. And we read some of the introduction to sort of tell us what's before, but we can't always take that context and contextualize the finding of now. You know, that's what an expert's for. <laughs> that's why you need experts to sort of digest that stuff. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, part of what we're, part of, part of what we're doing on this program in some ways is like, we're amplifying just like parts of, of stories, but we want to encourage people to, to think critically and, and dive deep. Right. And always like, I, there's so many caveats. I think we say that every oh, time. Oh yeah. We we're people. learning at the right? same like time you are. Yeah. So that's right. Right. That's kind of the thing. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's. So in this so in this paper, the other thing that um, they were able to do is that they they sequenced the pools of viruses that went into um, the, pa the the specific passages to get a sense of you know did those mutations exist in the population beforehand as well right um, like yeah so like and this this sort of ties into the something that we had said before, I try to pull like estimations of the mutation rate, right? Because everyone's saying it doesn't mutate that much. It has uh, proofreading capability mm. and things. But um, something that this paper reported was, uh, well, there is there is some sort of, uh, there are like um, a, a, a more diverse set, I think, of viruses. I think we may have seen this in another paper as well, where they looked at inter uh, patient variability versus intra-patient variability. Right. So like variability within an individual in terms of genotypes and then between individuals. Um, so I'll, we'll reiterate it again for this paper that um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus sort of exi exists as a population mm. uh, where there's, of course, the major genotype, but then there's probably a few outliers and a few particles of outliers. Um, maybe we should go down to uh, some figures for folks to see. Let's, yeah. Uh, so, um, oh, right. You have to have the PDF for this one. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, which figure do you think is uh, the best one to show? Because I think there's on page on page thirty, they have something where they're just showing like, oh, here here's the instances. They have different pools from when they picked out um, when different pools of the passage, and then finding some mutation frequency um, uh, at different sites. <clears throat> All right. So page thirty, right? Uh, yeah. Page 30. Yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, right. So this one, they're able to... So I think each of these single windows are like um, a different passage that they've picked out the viruses from right. uh, in, in different cell types. And then they just see that, okay, there is at certain... And then the, along the x-axis, that's just like the whole genome, basically, all the positions on the genome. Right. So anything that kind of pops up here says that, like, that position is changing uh, in these passages. And again, like, it's, this was already known, but, like, contextualizing it in this way of, like, uh, or contextualizing it in the thought that this is showing a flexibility of the virus to uh, use maybe different mechanisms. Like, it just shows us there is existing flexibility, right, in in the landscape of all mutations on the virus uh, to make differences, to, to, yeah, to have differences. Right, I see. Um, and then, and then I think the final, and then the only other takeaway is, like, on page, page 34. <laughs> 
they end up using, and, and this is going back to the point, the Omicron point, mm -hmm. right? They end up using our, these inhibitors, right? Furin inhibitors or Camistat, uh, which is a fusion inhibitor, or not a fusion, like a... Uh, a TMPR and, assist and a thing, pathway. I thought. Uh, I oh, thought yeah, e TMPR assist yeah. too. Oh, E64D is the... A endocytic um, part. Endocytic, yeah. Yeah, is the endocytic inhibitor. Um, and, and yeah, and they sort of... and. And in this one, they're showing that um, that there is like uh, there are during these passages, we're seeing we're seeing that shift right from uh, requiring um, requiring fear and cleavage to, to not requiring it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, quite interesting insight into the evolution, how like SARS-CoV-2 can evolve and adapt. Um, mm -hmm. But now we're going to be going into this is an interesting one because this is. Because uh, they use a really interesting experimental setup for this, but the title of it is The Dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 Infectivity with Changes in Aerosol Microenvironment. So, yeah, this is also a callback, I think, to an earlier paper um, that we may have covered, just talking about aerosolized SARS and, and SARS like getting deposited on various surfaces. How long does it last, right? Um, I think largely the our public health understanding has moved away from like being too concerned about fomite transmission hmm. uh, and really focused heavily on the aerosol transmission. Um, and in this paper, they use a different mechanism to make aerosols than in earlier papers. <laughs> um, so in earlier papers, they use something called a rotating drum setup, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a drum that kind of rotates around. And I think that produces a certain current in the air that allows for aerosols to remain suspended for a longer amount of time than they would normally. Yeah. But that's the thing um, that amazes me about this paper. But, it's about levitating aerosols, levitating like particles of virus yes. for a specific amounts of time. Yeah, so they use a different mechan mechanism, not that rotating drum, but I think theirs is controlled with electricity. Right. <laughs> the magic of electrical components. Yeah. yeah and they're able to, as you say, levitate <laughs> levitate tiny particles of a of a dis of a specific size in a specific humidity environment um, in order to test uh, how the SARS-CoV-2 particles degrade in those tiny droplets. <laughs> yeah, they call it the celebs technique, which is controlled electrodynamic levitation and extraction of bioaerosols on a substrate. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and it's... Yeah, just kind of cool, <laughs> very yeah. interesting. Also, um, if people aren't aware, like aerosol chemistry is like a whole field. <laughs> There's just like a bunch of people, like, you know, physics looks at every mm. phenomena and tries to figure out what's going on. And so like, th I think that's what this tool comes from. It comes from sort of like deeper, deeper in the field of aerosol uh, physics and chemistry. Someone has brought up a more relevant or a, a better tool for looking at aerosols. Um, and what's interesting that they find is that uh, they do last, the SARS-CoV-2, they have infectious SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. particles in these droplets. Uh, they have like some FBS and some media. That's the, what they make the droplets in. I guess that's supposed to approximate yeah. our, our secretions, our nasal secretions. Um, and they show that uh, it seems like a little bit that the infectivity drops off after um, some time. <clears throat> yes. And a bit faster than in that rotating drum technique. And I think oh the key... The the so they, they they looked at like <laughs> humidity and found like that high humidity keeps these droplets like more active and so the theory is mm -hmm. that uh when when you keep these droplets in when the droplets are suspended in the air they're kind of constantly evaporating water off their surfaces which causes mm -hmm. salt to precipitate out and so if you if a droplet stays in the air for too long all, the water will start to evaporate, and the, and the salt will actually uh, do this thing called efflorescence, which is the ability for salt to crystallize on the surface of things. And so it will start to yeah. crystallize on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 and make it in, inactive. So I think that's their theory of mm -hmm. what's happening. And I think they, they do run some tests with salt crystals to to kind of demonstrate it. Yeah. Uh, if you can go to figure S5, <laughs> they actually have... SEM images of um, of the droplets. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, there's one there too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's one. Yeah. So three. there. Are eight... And yeah, these yeah, are the nicer one ones because you can see like at different relative humidities, the the sizes of the 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 crystal Salt crystals. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. It, mm -hmm. it changes. And so you can imagine that that so you know droplets aren't then uniform objects, right? Like it matters like 
in those sections near the salt crystals, that concentration is going to be really high, and it's not going to be good for the viruses that are there. Um, and I think that that's the advantage of using this celebs technique is mm. that they're able to sort of long term suspend these droplets and really uh, precisely control their size in the system. So they remove that part, uh, that that uh, source of error. Um, and they find that, yeah, there's a sort of a heavy dependence on SARS-CoV-2 survivability uh, based on the the relative humidity, right? So if you have a very humid environment, it means less evaporation is happening off the surface, and so SARS-CoV-2 survives longer in these um, in these particles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's an interesting experimental system to investigate questions about how like mm -hmm. in fact this is interesting for all bacteria and i'm so glad i've learned about this because i mean there are some bacteria who they like <laughs> pseudomonas syringae they is linked to creating snow so i'm wondering if you like did that and yes. yeah snowflakes and there's all sorts of cool stuff you can do with this um mm -hmm. but oh yeah like yeah just, outside of the sars cov 2 question like yeah that's sort of it's fascinating to think about just being able to control tiny particles like this, um, yeah, gives us a, an insight into, I mean, microbes live in very small environments, so these are very important to be able to study. Anyway, next paper. Wait, oh, wait, wait, ooh, let's, ooh, can we just go to figure six ooh, okay. of this paper? Figure six, <laughs> let's go. Uh, yeah, figure. So, so figure six, I think, is their take-home figure here. Um, in A, they're going to show on the x-axis um, time going forward, and then the infectivity of the particles, mm. right? And so then, and they have the two humidities. They're using the 90% humidity and the 40% humidity, and you can see that it drops off right at like 1,800 seconds. Um, the infectivity of these particles, uh, and and that's much lower than the than the um, than the percentages that were given from a different paper that was earlier published with a different technique for making uh, the particles. So the idea here is that um, they're not as long lived maybe, right? Aerosols aren't as long lived in terms of infectious aerosols, aren't as long lived as previously reported. Yeah, um, well, one of the reasons yeah. they say that is also the way the technique works is uh, apparently like the roti rotating drums have a poorly, they, I think they wrote, said this word, they, rotating drums have a poorly defined time zero, meaning that benchmark infectivity, which can be very variable. Um, mm -hmm. So get wrecked rotating drums. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm half expecting this to be sponsored by people, the people invented this, but... It's... Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone has to rep their, their favorite yeah. tool, right? Yeah. Their favorite experimental technique. That's just... Yeah, yeah. Gilson Pipettes for life. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so in some ways this paper then is like a small sliver of good news in the sense that like like aerosols are the primary infectious are thought to be the primary infectious route. Um, they're not as long lived as we previously thought, but they still are the thing. So masks again, but maybe like uh, if everyone was doing this, I don't know if people are doing like their own right SARS-CoV-2 approaches, right, and being like, oh my God, there's such long lived aerosols. I'm always making sure my room is like no people are in it for this interval, right? Like you can maybe like some of those intervals, right? Don't have to be as long as they used to be. If that's if that w if if that's how people were interpreting the previous information. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, this is still very early like research. I mean, this, this, this hasn't got like the infection of like one person infecting another. It hasn't got that level of detail yet because it's still very much like a, a a model that's kind of removed from the real situation. So again, we don't know about yeah. the concentrations. Uh, so we don't get a sense of that long tail. Well, I think. Well, I think a really important thing that is in here is that like this is just like this is these are single particles just like they just sit there, right? right. But if there is somebody in a space who is infectious, like they're constantly spewing particles, yeah, right, and that's like a very different scenario. Um, so again, like uh, you know, like uh, we always say, like that's that's why we have non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just like maybe maybe some people were really afraid about how long they live and like this can be like a little bit of okay like they are in the air yes mm. we know um but but like it's manageable yeah it is a manageable the, thing they're not in the air forever so you can open a window or like have a conversation outdoors yeah I mean, it's 
Well, yeah, I mean, a big, if you're in Southern those, Hemisphere, are, those were already things yeah. that we knew were safe activities, right? It's just reinforcement, but like, anyways, that that line sits inside of this paper. Uh, yeah, I think what the main <laughs> thing is that this paper is just like a cool technique that can be used by people to study how airborne back mm. airborne like organisms live in this environment, and I think it's to totally yeah. Um, All right. Let's let's push on then. Yeah, let's push on too. <laughs> oh yeah, this this very <laughs> very clickbaity. <laughs> I, actually, I think since this this paper came out, there's been another cannabinoid paper published in Science or something like that. Um, but yeah, cannabinoids block cellular entry, SARS-CoV-2, and the emerging variants. Man, they tacked on the emerging variants as well to this. I mean, why not? Um, <laughs> um... Yeah, why not? Why not? So this is um, this this is in like a chemistry uh, chemistry journal, uh, ACS an ACS well, publication journal of natural um, products. So it is very much focusing mm -hmm. on like derivatives of plant like of natural products that might be like great things mm -hmm. for bioprospects. So trying to find the next yes. artemisinin or like other like potential drugs that could be useful. Absolutely. And so when they design their experiment here, they are specifically looking right for for the phenomena, right, of um, uh, cannabinoids. Or is it do they use all sorts sorts of things, or do they use all sorts of cannabinoids? So they, they use a plate? they use a bunch of different uh, derivatives that they extract from cannabis. Uh, so they mm -hmm. test out. I think they they test out a bunch of them using uh, a specific type of. Uh, oh, I can't remember the test. It's. Um, well, they're using they use mass spec to identify which ones are binding, and they do that with like uh, magnetic beads that have the um, the spike protein on it. Right. <laughs> and uh, they just basically dip them into all these different derivatives that they have, and then they uh, see what what sticks well, um, and they sequence that, or they don't sequence it. They find the masses of those of the molecules that got um, jammed into the the S1 subunit. Yeah, they've got the SBP1 peptide, which basically has is a sequence that I think the a sequence on ACE2 that SARS-CoV-2 can bind to. So they have that on a mm -hmm. magnetic bead. So anything that can bind to SARS-CoV-2 can, I think, well, I, I mean, let me think. I think I got my, myself confused there. No, no, I think, no, no, I think they have the SBP1 like floating around. Right. And on the bead is the piece of the spike. And so they... First, they mix the beads with like some of those, um, like the mysterious compounds, and then they they suck all the beads up and they see what's attached to the beads, basically, right? They can they can figure out the masses of things that are attached to the beads. So if they do end up getting, um, if they if if there is something, some compound that binds to the S1 subunit and prevents the um, prevents the ACE the SBP right ACE portion of the ACE2 from binding, then they'll see that on the mass. They'll be like, oh, that's a thing that is stopping the SBP from attaching itself. Yeah, <laughs> and I think they found like three uh, co compounds as CBDA. I think that's a uh, cannabin... I can't remember. Um, uh, I only remember <laughs> the THC one because that's tetrahydrocannabinolic acid A. Um, oh yeah, I don't know what they stand for. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but either way, they found these three compounds that look quite promising uh, as kind of... They they stick to the spike protein. And, okay, proteins do they tend to... stick to the spike protein. Yeah. So that is a good first start for any drug. Um, yeah. They stick they stick to the spike protein and they prevent this small little pep... This, like, peptide region of the ACE2 from then subsequently sticking. Right, <laughs> yeah. So I think the rest of the paper is a lot of biochemistry to try and figure out, like... Uh, what, what part of the molecule of what how, where, how, where's the yeah. binding happening uh, so you've got like some mm -hmm. nice little diagrams of all these different like products and how they might be binding to spike um, mm -hmm. and then we've got yeah. uh, a, a test to Ooh. see in uh, cells whether it can protect, prevent mm -hmm. a SARS-CoV-2 in a pseudovirus infection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, a little bit <laughs> yeah it looks like they're, yeah it looks like a little bit so a uh, so around like oh actually yeah. yeah actually they they do it over a concentration right so they kind of see like where the yeah where the concentration is they as they increase the concentration so there are concentrations where it doesn't work at all yeah there's like quite <laughs> right? yeah quite a lot of concentrations where it doesn't work at all but like i think yeah. <laughs> it's about like uh let me look on this graph finding like a scaffold maybe right like because 
like in the in the realm of trying to develop new drugs, they'd be like, oh, but maybe they can like modify it in some way to make it better, right? Like this is this is the line of thinking that these researchers are going on, right? Is that like okay, they've identified a source, right, uh, a a potential molecule that works, but then you know to turn that into a drug, right, that is actually effective, like there might be a lot of tweaking that needs to be done. So yeah, it's going. It's, it says around like thirty one point six or thirty. Uh, like micrograms per well, let's benchmark it about 100 micrograms per mil is when you when they you definitely see a, an effect in cells. Um, so yes. if we yes. like scale <laughs> that up to humans, uh, a human has about it's about like 40 liters. So I think that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that would be like ah, uh, I wrote down the oh, calculation. Trying to do the math. Yeah, try and do the math, but it'd be a, a fair lot and. Thing is, these aren't the active ingredients. It, I don't think they're the active ingredients in uh, in cannabis, and the amount you actually get from smoking it won't be enough to to cure to cure SARS. But well, it's not going to cure anything. No, right? it's just preventing binding. Yeah, it's preventing <laughs> binding. That's the thing. Uh, so I don't think this is a fully baked treatment. But like, um, yeah, maybe. But I mean, yeah. it's. I think it's nice to to me. It's um, I think they make this value proposition proposition in their introduction, right? It's valuable to find um, uh, uses for these molecules because they are so widespread. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. It's sort of it's like uh, the infrastructure already exists to make a lot of it, and there's also uh, it's sort of like the safety profiles are also well established. So mm. um, drugs that come that are derived from these sources, like uh, first of all, like. It, they may be uh, more uh, economical to create, but then also that they have some pre-existing safety knowledge to to say that they shouldn't be too they shouldn't have too many bad um, side effects, something like that. Yeah, I ordinarily don't really like like this kind of in vitro research where you just take a random drug and you throw it at something. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very far away from the <laughs> the final form in which that we like. Basically, the assay they have isn't. Uh, isn't super informative of how it would actually be useful in a, a real life infection. Yeah, so there's a lot of other things you have to think about. So this is a good first step, but what you want to look at afterwards is like, say, testing in like actual p organisms. So uh, you're looking at, mm -hmm. we want to think about pharmacokinetics. So like that's the where the drug mm -hmm. goes in the body, how quickly it's cleared, because if it's cleared very fast, it probably won't have the effect. Um, mm -hmm. Pharmacodynamics, is it going to the right place? Is it having other effects that you don't want? Um, but yeah, um, for this study, yeah. I'm not willing to make an exception if they decide, you know, just so just if you want to get some stuff dispensed to you and go, well, it can cure uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this study, <laughs> can, so you know, can I get that script? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, I feel like there's a lot of um, sort of like yeah, positive health benefits people have associated with cannabinoids, and so just add this to the long list of potential ones. Um, yeah, but keep it in the potentials, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think this is something to, to watch for the future because again, there is a big industry of can around cannabis. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. I mean, natural mm -hmm. products farm 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 is still a form of big pharma, so we probably are going to see some. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that brings our SARS-CoV-2 section to a close. And we've just got three more papers on the docket to discuss. Uh, this next one is protein interactome analysis of the type 9 secretion system identifies pore W as the missing link between pore K uh, N-ring complex and the SOV translocon. So uh, we've talked about, I think we've talked about type 7 secretion on this program before, the ESS secretion system. Uh, and, and I think in that, oh, that might have been a deep dive. And so in that deep dive, we give backgrounds that there's like a whole bunch of secretion systems that exist inside of uh, bacteria. And uh, here's type 9, which I'd never heard of before finding this this article. Um, but I guess, you know, as, as with most things, it, it People have been talking about it before I stumbled upon the first paper. Um, I know. The... Things exist before we look at them. It's frustrating to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I always want to be the first. The center but... of the universe. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's the center of the universe. <laughs> I am constantly depressed by that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Um... So the, 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 the clade of bacteria that this is uh, well 
defined in is the Bacteroidetes, uh, specifically mm. this Porphyromonas gingiv gingivalis. So that is uh, one of the bacteria that lives in our oral microbiota and is thought to potentially be an opportunistic pathogen of some sort um, oh, is... where it causes our gingivitis. Yeah. Oh, ginger... <laughs> yeah. Okay, that explains the name. Gingivalis, gingivitis, that's a good way to remember it. Uh... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it makes a bunch of proteases. That's the, that's the thought in the pathogenesis, right? Is it has some sort of niche where it lives on our, um, in our microbiota. And if it comes to a certain concentration, it can make a bunch of like proteases that sort of erode our gums. Uh, so it can get more nutrients from them. <laughs> right. Yeah. So this, this bacteria sucks and I don't like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, classic, right? A uh, classic way to think about, right? Uh, you know, researchers versus uh, their arch nemesis bacteria is uh, like, do we know anything about how they get those proteases out, right? And uh, sort of previous research had identified a set of proteins that are, uh, are thought to be part of a secretion system, which they are dubbing the type nine secretion system. Uh, so in this paper, they go in and they um, they use an antibody for one part of the uh, they use an antibody for one part of that secretion system, and they uh, stain like a variety of different um, uh, protein for, protein. Uh, lysates from um, uh, gingivalis as well as uh, uh, missing uh, missing specific uh, type 9 secretion proteins uh, and they're sort of trying to find out if they if they stain for this one protein can they find and 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 use different strains that are missing uh, subsets of those proteins can they find what is attached to what <laughs> through yeah. this method so can they find what's attached to sov <laughs> so this is a very traditional like uh, bacteriology and microbiology so where you have to like we've got mm -hmm. an idea that there's this like secretion system that has multiple parts but we don't know how they fit together so we're almost like yep. you, you've got a fit kinder egg toy and you're trying to put it together but we don't have any instructions it's like that where they're trying to find out which pits like fit with each other in order to figure out the relationship yep. between the whole thing yeah so, yeah, and like, yeah, I, I like that. Let's let's extend the analogy as always to try to get a better understanding. So like, yeah, the, the Kinder Egg is like microscopically sized, right? So you, and 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 you can grow up your bacteria of choice and have fully assembled versions of it, but you can't see them mm -hmm. <laughs> directly, right? They're too small to look at, and so that's why they. So, but they do have a way to see one of the components. Right, so you can ha selectively go in and pull out one of those components, this SOV one, mm. and you can see what's attached to it <laughs> as a way of figuring out what's going on. <clears throat> right, exactly. And then based on that, if you do that with enough things, you can kind of build up a picture of what you're meant to be making. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, and I think they they go out about this in other ways too. They also have like a, in Figure Three, they have uh, another classic methodology in this particular. Um, this particular type of experimental design, which is like uh, they have their bait, they have the thing that they think sticks to one thing, and they have uh, what they think, yeah, they have two objects and they're seeing, do they stick together? And if they stick together, then uh, the cell sort of makes some color for us. Um, and so this is like, uh, it's kind of going the opposite way, right? Like, can we re, can we reconstitute some sort of connection yeah. and then uh, understand what's touching what? <laughs> so yeah, I think, and based off that, they build a like a model of so yeah a lot of like this mm -hmm. is like a crossword puzzle where, i mean yeah i'm mixing analogies okay uh it's like yeah a cro <laughs> like a lot of it is like a cross it's like a sudoku it's like a wordle where because i'm yeah that's it's like a wordle like, yeah, where yeah this is just science wordle. i'm throwing <laughs> the, but yeah so it's a jigsaw puzzle where but they, where they don't get to see all the pieces but eventually like based on the experiments they run they can build a model of what we think is what's happening so I think they they find yeah. like the poor W like this is, yeah no this is this is the model that they end up building right uh, the thinking that yeah this W touches SOV it, this is the new the new piece of information that's being extracted um, from all of these sort of pairwise interactions so, that they study yeah because yeah. they found that SOV was bound to all these molecules but then they realized that, oh maybe it's that interaction is mediated through another protein that is doing all the binding and so they kind of mm -hmm. like narrowed it down. Um, to build this yes. idea of yes. how this molecular machine is put together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so cool. I, I feel like I 
I'm very interested from the idea of like what how this type set nine secretion system works in context with other things, and and hopefully there'll be a lot more research uh, around that in the future. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next paper. All right. Is Longitudinal analysis reveals high prevalence of Epstein-Barr virus associated with multiple sclerosis. Yeah, so actually pretty crazy. Um, MS is uh, the edi like the the causative agent of MS is sort of eluded people. They know that it's an uh, some sort of immune mediated disease because uh, you can observe right like the immune cells attacking the myelin sheath of people's axons, right? Your ner neuron cells. Um, but in terms of like why it happens, um, that information has been difficult to pin down. Um, but in this paper, they have a huge um, longitudinal sample of serum uh, from uh, folks with who, who develop MS both before they develop it as well as after they develop the symptoms. Um, and they have matched controls for those individuals, right? Another set of serum where MS is never developed in the course of all serum samples. Um, and, and yeah, that, that provides uh, the data set in which that they can try to tease out things. They have, two hypo they have a hypothesis that it is uh, Epstein-Barr virus is, is the causative agent. Uh, and they have a control. They have another virus, CMV, which is a similarly um, DNA-based virus. And so that's used as a control here. Um, and, and yeah, and they're going to try to tease out whether or not uh, Epstein-Barr virus could be the causative agent. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting. They, so they, this is a US military study. So I think the tests were d done to check for AIDS, but they still kept the samples and mm -hmm. records. And they end up having like so the samples of over 10 million people over the course of 20 years. And these, so these samples have taken regularly as well. So for some people, they have samples before they get, and of course, Epstein-Barr virus is one of the most successful viruses out there. Cause I think this prevalence mm -hmm. is around like 90%, like Nine, nine out of ten people in the population are infected by it, which makes studying it yeah. very hard because it's very hard to get that counterfactual of what, what happens if someone isn't infected with Epstein-Barr virus. And so that's mm -hmm. why we have this have this really big study to find out, find a group of people who didn't have Epstein virus and a group of people who, mm -hmm. who did. And also, even more rarely, the people in that group who get who develop multiple sclerosis because that isn't a right. common disease. <laughs> so it. Mm -hmm. At least I hope it's not common. I didn't check. Um, yeah, no, it, it's not. It's not super common. So uh, yeah, that's they need this huge data set. The only way you'd find this association is by jacking up the numbers of the people. And, and again, you need sort of high quality data from these individuals. You need like longitudinal serum. That's not easy to get. And yeah, I guess the, being in the military, you know, your your bodies are sort of owned partially by by the state. So. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good source. Yeah, so they got like eight eight hundred and one MS cases, and then they did this thing where they had two mm -hmm. controls of people who were like had the same background, age, and uh, kind of jobs as well. Because of course you want to make sure mm -hmm. that that people aren't getting MS from like say working in a nuclear submarine next to the reactor. For, like you need to yeah. like, have those kind of controls to make sure you can find out the right kind of because we really want to focus in on whether yeah. people have or do not have the EBV virus in this sort of situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a really, uh, like, the strength of this study is on the back of the data set that they're able to bring together. Um, it, it allows them to sort of internally control for a lot of potential confounders, uh, as well as just meet the statistical numbers <laughs> required to make this type of association. <clears throat> yeah, so they find, I think, that there is... A oh, wait, oh, yeah. sorry, I want to say... Um, and so uh, Epstein-Barr virus, so Epstein-Barr, these are DNA, sort of large DNA, double-stranded mm. DNA viruses. Herpes virus is sort of in the same group, right? CMV is also in this group, cytomegalovirus. Um, they are known for uh, integrating or uh, being, being maintained within long-lived maintenance of these viral genomes in some cell type. So specifically Epstein-Barr, it just, just sits out inside of, I think, memory B cells as an episome, like as a plasmid, essentially, that uh, replicates along with, with the genome of those, those cells. Um, and so they have to do sequencing. You have to do sort of deep uh, DNA sequencing of all of these uh, samples and then scan through the sequence looking for the traces of Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, and then I remember as control CMV. <laughs> so you might know Epstein virus from such a disease as mononucleosis and 
uh, I think it causes a, a couple cooties. Cooties, yeah, it causes <laughs> cooties. No, I don't know. Yeah, it causes kiss, kiss, kissing disease. Yeah, kissing disease. That's what people. Yeah, that's what it's called. Mono. Yeah, and <laughs> glandular fever as well. So, uh, mm. yeah, it, <laughs> but I mean, obviously, it's a bit more complicated than that because there's so. It, the, because once you get it, you kind of have it dormant for for life. It's very hard to get rid of afterwards. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So they do their analysis and uh, they find yeah, like if they look at early serum samples before the onset of MS, uh, there's a lower prevalence of Epstein Barr. But then uh, in those later serum samples, uh, they after the appearance of MS, they see Epstein Barr. Yeah, uh, and that's not the same relationship as CMV, which is another you know virus in the same class. So yeah, um, CMV also has a very high prevalence as well. And like again, you could come up with the same kind of like hypothesis as CMV as well. Um, mm-hmm. And what, and yeah, I think like because thing about Epstein Barr virus it is very vulnerable to being associated with multiple diseases. So. Uh, like, yes. like if you run a Google search with Epstein Barr Bar virus and idiopathic, you'll come up with lots of results because because it is so prevalent. It is easy when people are really yeah. like desperate to find a cause of something to for them to like say isolate a sample of Epstein Barr virus and be like jacuz. This is obviously the cause. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So this is why this study is quite important. The way that it's been designed specifically to kind of avoid the kind of mistakes that other other studies have had in the past. Right. Right. Yeah, until you've done it with 10 million samples, don't don't tell me it's Epstein Barr virus. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and and I think that that's that's basically where it is, right? It's just it's this association that they that they um, well, pull out. Yeah, it's it's interesting because they also like look at they don't just look at whether the Epstein virus virus set, they also look at like kind of the development of like MS because they also look at kind of the time between the, the early indicators where like certain diseases enter the blood. And what they can, and it's this, and anytime you have an Epstein Barr virus study like this, there there's always that counterfactual that's in the background because we we found that mm-hmm. the Epstein Barr virus is associated with MS. So almost like in here, it seems like it is a determined factor where like only like all the cases of MS had, were people who were infected with the Epstein Barr virus. But the mm-hmm. thing that's hanging up in mind is not so much like oh that's great, but. W- why did all the other people in this cohort with Epstein Barr virus not get MS? Not get MS. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that is the mm-hmm. the big question I don't know these studies because I guess what we have found here is one cause, but there is definitely something else going on that caught because ninety yeah. percent of the planet have Epstein Barr virus, but ninety percent of the planet don't have MS. So we have to explain why that is the case. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a that's a really important point. Um, but from and but from the standpoint of understanding uh, how to treat MS, mm. this could be a big thing. Yeah. Because if people then target more specifically, th- we might find we might find better therapies for MS by focusing on this potential target. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I think, mm. and this also kind of highlights how important is like the early detection of MS because it is like mm. a, a cumulative damage. So the earlier you catch yes, it, the that's right. better it is. Um, Yes. Yeah, it's because it's it's a very strange disease because like yeah, it's definitely not it's not as the the pathogenesis of it is not going to be as simple as like like the virus is making something that is causing MS. Like um like it's already well known. I, I guess I've read a, some MS mm. pathogenesis literature before. Like it's sort of like a some sort of like a negative feedback or some feedback loop within the immune system causes like progressive neurodegeneration and so um yeah it, it's definitely not going to be as easy as like oh we 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 we, we knock this thing out of the virus and the problem is gone now but um but just having this insight is going to be really helpful for diving into that immunology and saying like so then what could be manipulated by this virus in this cycle and uh can we find a way to block that interaction between yeah uh yeah I- the immune system and yeah, and I think that's really important because because uh, now we because we know mm-hmm. that EBV is inside like B cells and uh, l- linking yeah. it to to MS means that people will be laser focused on what B memory cells are doing potentially mm-hmm. and that could be mm-hmm. quite useful in finding yep. out treatments. Um, 
Yes. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, because we know how complicated the immune system is and how those cells have like so many different ways of communicating with the other parts of the body. And so, yeah, just having more information can like will help. Yeah. Focus. Focus. Yeah. Down. So this is like directing our view to a specific area to focus on for research, which uh -huh. is really useful for a disease where we didn't have that before. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, and so moving on to our last paper, Global Burden of Bacterial Antimicrobial Resistance in 2019, a Systematic Analysis. So this paper is pulling papers, <laughs> pulling reports from all over the world um, for from 2019 uh, to basically come to uh, like some hard estimations as to what how much antimicrobial resistance is affecting us these days <laughs> yeah it's interesting because antimicrobial resistance is actually quite difficult to like even kind of contextualize because you're not just talking about say one pathogen you're talking about multiple pathogens that distributed between different countries and they even have like different mm -hmm. resistance so trying to so often we, you might get a report about, oh, MRSA is really prevalent, or you've got a carbenicillin-resistant mm -hmm. enterobacteria or something like that. So, But this one kind of groups mm -hmm. everything together, and we get... So we this gets a more global view. So let me see. Like they, Again, we, to the, to this week we're doing lots of big data studies. I think here, uh, last paper we had 10 million. This one covers 471 million individual records. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah massive and that's <clears throat> just for like 2019 in order to like get an idea of like what these numbers were um mm -hmm. so yeah and then they have to go through the the difficult step of going through each of those data and sort of um classifying them by uh the the sort of the types of the type of information that it's telling people telling us, uh, right, gr grouping them in a way that they can then create um, sort of high-level summaries for 2019. Yeah, so what they're trying to get out of the data is, like, how many people, like, died of a specific disease, uh, and mm -hmm. then whether, like, uh, anti uh, bacteria was related to that. So so sometimes, you, so you get, like, some people died straight from, like, say, like, uh, uh, like uh, E. coli or, like, the fleshing disease or something like that, but then you get people who get... Mm -hmm kind of an infection as a result of something else. So you go into hospital, you have an injury, and you get hospital-acquired infection, or you're like, or some, you, you or you get pregnant, and then mm -hmm. suddenly, like, you get a post-operative infection. So there's lots of, like, associated, yep. like, so sepsis is, like, one of the diseases that has multiple causes, aren't necessarily, like, straightforward. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like, mm -hmm. a, you get sepsis from a cut. I mean, there's a famous king who died because he killed someone, and then the severed head of that person bit him, while he was riding a horse, and from that <laughs> infection, he died. So it's kind oh my of, gosh! <laughs> back in the days of like before antibiotics, it was wild. Um, yeah, <laughs> just, the severed head bit him. Is that, yeah, well, is, apparently he was like carrying a... it in his like it, not so much bit it, but like he like kind of carried it awkwardly oh, yeah, it and scratched. it like scratched him. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> tooth decay, like, you got loads of bacteria. Being bitten by a human is, like, is not great. Um, it's not good, yeah. So what they want <laughs> to do here was they want to take all those infections and classify how many of those were, like, due to antibiotic resistant deaths and then explore that counterfactual of what happens if antimicrobial resistance wasn't... What happens if it was, like, a normal infection that responds to antibiotics? What And apply that, that mm -hmm. level of mortality to those cases to see how much the overall mortality numbers would change. Yes. Yeah, so they have, right, I think it's their ability to see a large set of, of, um, of, of microbial infections and, and classify them between were they with a resistance strain or a non-resistance strain. Uh, and I think that that could also be based on just like chart review as well. That didn't have to be like direct, um, like, uh, culturing of, of, of the organism. Yeah. So <laughs> often what they do is they take like some chart review. They also take, uh, some pro so they took studies that have looked at antibody resistance based on like, uh, disc assays where you put on, you put an antibiotic mm. blob on a Petri mm -hmm. dish and see how well it kills off the bacteria. If it doesn't kill off the bacteria, bacteria is probably resistant. Um, yeah, and they, then they use that to like derive the probabilities of of uh, bacteria being like resistant or um, yeah a certain type of bacteria being resistant, and then they can apply that wholesale right to a set of of bacterial infections. Yeah, and from this they they kind of they they learn a bit more than just like how many people are dying of the infection. They're also learning about like where people are are dying from from antibiotic resistant infections mm. and like. 
where the gaps in the data are. And spoiler, they're kind of in the same place. Um, so they've got some <laughs> like maps about of of countries that are being. So they, yeah, they look at this globally. And let me scroll down quickly because there are a lot of like maps in this paper. They have maps. Yeah. Oh yeah, the maps on page. Oh, you're looking at the internet. Yeah, I'm looking at the internet. I am very very new school. <laughs> very data <laughs> but yeah well what they find they say so classify by different like bacteria and they find that what tends to be the case is like uh so for the western world we tend tend to get like two main uh antibody resistant bacteria that we're afraid of so that would be the uh St staphylococcus i think e coli mm -hmm. uh but the rest of them mm -hmm. are kind of knocked back whereas in the developing world it's a lot more diverse uh, so I'm saying yeah. there's developing world, there's low middle income countries. Uh, so play, so what we're finding in here is is that in the Western world, antibody resistance isn't isn't as prevalent as it is in the low middle income countries. So not the less economically developed countries, but the, in the kind of the countries that are undergoing that that industrial revolution, like or po the kind yeah. of they're developing into advanced econ economies. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think one of the main take. So yeah. Um, so yeah, they they have. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that that's a good takeaway in of itself. Yeah. Right. To to be able to um, understand where yeah where the highest prevalence of antimicrobial resistance is. <laughs> yeah, like health systems like in India and in in China, I I guess, but India and sub-Saharan Africa are like the places where yeah. we're seeing a lot of different uh, antibiotics. Each one of these, each one of these map graphs are basically the right the distribution of one specific antimicrobial resistant pathogen across the globe. Yeah. So I mean, it would have been helpful if they like had like kind of put all these together into one figure. Merged view. Yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, <laughs> uh -huh. they separated them out, which means we get to. And I think that's also been the problem of like that actually is a problem of looking at antimicrobial resistance anyway because. Uh, we we constantly get like the individual pictures of of each strain, but we want to see it mm -hmm. all like together because it isn't just about mm -hmm. like a specific strain. It's about the hospital systems that surround it and a lot of the yes. And I I feel and for the numbers they get from this. Are, so what their the the lower bounds of their estimate is I think over like 1.29 million people died from antibiotic resistant bacteria in 2019, which is basically like half a SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. I think. Um, Mm -hmm. And their upper bound is four million, um, so it's between the, that area. But we don't hear about it much because most of that is concentrated in India, sub-Saharan Africa, and and again, it's not. And we don't get here reported as one disease. We're here reported as lots of smaller diseases, and so that's right makes it easier to like kind of fall below our radar. Ignore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. <clears throat> yeah, but it's something that is growing right i think that's maybe another theme that comes out mm. from our news channels right as as folks who've studied bacteria like this is something that should be on our radar because go going back to um not having effective antibiotics is a huge hit to the healthcare system so understanding yeah where it's happening and then more importantly right the mechanisms that are contributing to it and what can be uh be done to prevent that 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 rise <laughs> yeah i think there is a i'm i think another theme is that we need to have like a global healthcare, like I mm. do something about that because, like, these places, like, are where like the omicrons and the like deltas eventually come out from because they they don't have the strong a strong healthcare system, and that is a problem for mm -hmm. everyone globally. And mm -hmm. so, uh, I mean, in here, so I did do a bit of more reading around this, and the, so the impression I get from, okay. is what, from what's happening in these sorts of systems is uh, that. Like kind of antibiotics are being used as like a stopgap solution for like dealing with larger like the healthcare systems need to have more resources to deal with infrastructure like getting clean water and other things. So, I mean, mm. I'm gonna have to use another terrible ana analogy. So the okay, okay, I'm the, ready. yeah, okay. This is a, a fact that so in 1950s people discovered antibiotics could be used as growth promoters, and Mm -hmm. So if you give them to like intensively farmed animals, you'd have they'd end up growing like much bigger and much more healthier. And so there's this idea, oh, maybe antibiotics are doing something, gro and and of course this caused a bit of controversy because antibiotic resistance it was a thing even then. And so I think in 2011, mm -hmm. like the Netherlands like banned 
2011 or 2009 or something like that, Netherlands banned, like, the use of antibiotics as, like, preemptive growth promoters. And it, and once uh. they did that, they had to find other solutions to make animals, like, grow as big. To, like, so once you've got, like, so you're trying to, to like, recreate that same effect. And what they did was they improved sanitation. They improved hygiene. They, uh. they started to look at, like, a bit more at the animal welfare. And they found that they could uh-huh. reconstitute some of those effects of growth by looking off sanitation. And uh-huh. so it turns out, like, this whole time, that the antibiotic growth problems in that situation was were acting as almost like a, a stopgap, all-purpose polyfiller solution to... I see. In, and so when you have... So now that we have antibiotics, antibiotics, if you have a place that uh-huh. has not got much investment in sanitation, not much investment in hygiene, antibiotics are a stopgap solution that... So, so you, let's say you don't have a million pounds to create a sewage system... But you do have enough money to really get a yearly subscription to antibiotics. In the long term, you're paying more money, but in the short term, you don't have mm-hmm. that million pounds to get the hygiene in place. And so that's the kind of right. uh, like uh, catch. That could be one of that. That could be one of the drivers, right, of of uh, the scenario that leads to uh, resistance. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, we we talk about, but yeah, there's a lot out there so i think i was gonna say like there's there's probably tons of drivers right like another thing that i'm a little bit familiar with is um like just drug quality Mm. that i know that drug quality is very poor outside in in developing countries because their regulatory agencies aren't as well developed and so some companies will try to sell poor quality drugs to those regions um but if you think of that in antibiotics terms, that means that might be subclinical efficacy, <laughs> and uh, that could be driving uh, antimicrobial resistance rates as well. And so there's not enough testing in these areas to, to, for drug quality, and uh, that could be a, a large driver as well. Right? This is like kind of a you know, cor- corruption of our market system, where um, if if no one's watching, then companies are trying to get away with, um, yeah, just making less. Uh, of the active compound <laughs> yeah and it's it's funny like in place like india where they they are manufacturing vaccines for the whole world and then then because mm-hmm. of the economic incentives are forced to maybe not for, for, i don't know uh, um, again uh, for the past like 10 minutes i think i've been talking about stuff i don't really know very much about so i probably <laughs> should stop before i make people know what uh, they're talking a little about bit angry. Of a geopolitical a little <laughs> geopolitical rant i guess <laughs> yeah because um but YouTube really removed yeah. dislikes, so this is why this is why I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think that that's what we have for you guys today. I don't know if do you want to talk. Do you have any thoughts about papers that we want to put up for vote for our next deep dive? <clears throat> yeah, I think that that, that would be. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, things to put up for vote. Uh, I haven't got anything at yeah. the moment. I think we'll we will discuss off off the show. I think because I okay, don't have the list. Okay, that's good. To... And uh, if yeah, if any of our listeners want to chime in, then just let us know. We'll maybe put up the vote like sometime during the week so you guys have a window. Uh, let us know some paper that you want us to do a deep dive on. That's just like our last episode where we go figure by figure uh, into into something. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, join us next week for more microbiology news. <laughs> and we want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it is possible or probable that we didn't get everything right science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions so if you have any questions or critis- corrections please let us know in the comments i totally agree you can reach out to us over twitter at micro twjc or mastodon uh at uh, similar micro tw <laughs> micro jc uh at scicom.xyz um we both believe that peer review is a process which you can all participate in and we hope that you've had a good time listening to us ramble on about microbiology today if you think you have something to add or found something unclear just let us know in the comments it's been a ch- pleasure it's been a pleasure chatting with you danny same here fuzz bye <laughs> bye